right, all right. A little bit of Angeline the Baker there. This is the mandolin that I grew up playing. Just a cheap little Alvarez, a couple hundred bucks. Uh, my granddad had it. He unfortunately passed away last week. But all my heroes signed it. Sam Bush, and Bobby Clark, Jerry Douglas, and Aubrey Haney, Russ Berenberg, Ronnie McCurry, all kinds of great players. And another little cool little thing was I uh, desperately, desperately worshipped and wanted to be Sam Bush. And so Sam had cut his uh, the extended fretboard of the mandolin off. So I remember Gramps cutting that off too, which was really, really cool. And, uh, you know, thought it'd be kind of important to lead with that this week. You know, uh, right before, I guess it was just a few days before my grand passed, my granddad uh, passed away, uh, I saw that Mateus Asado had stepped away from social media. And I applaud Mateus. I think he is a world-class player and super nice guy. And uh, I loved what he had to say about it and his reasons why. But with that combined with the passing of my grandfather, I wanted to talk this week on The Woodshed about mental health, right? So uh, instead of me rambling on and on about my opinions of it, I thought it would be much cooler if I had a licensed professional come out and do it. So we have Stephanie Weatherstone. She uh, works in the mental health field and is an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee. Amazing individual, and she was so kind as to uh, jump on a Zoom call with me and uh, just give her expertise on the on the topic. So a uh, bit of a heavy episode this week, but sit back, hang out, and uh, hopefully this is good to you and can uh, help you improve uh, how you deal with social media as a musician, how you deal with, uh, you know, the mentality of being not only the creator, maybe, like, like I'm always posting and being on the creating side, but maybe the consumer and how you can improve what you digest in social media. So sit back, hang out, and let's roll it. <laughs> Hello music lovers and welcome back to The Woodshed. Uh, last week, or I guess probably a week and a half or so, uh, fellow Sir artist Mateus Asato decided to step away from social media and take a break from music. Um, obviously I know Mateus, we're not the best of friends, we're not the tightest of people because he lives in Brazil most of the time and when he's in the U.S. he lives on the West Coast. But Mateus and I have done NAM events and SIR events and things like that and I adore Mateus and I love his playing. He's a world-class player who's toured with Tori Kelly, I mean, and, and just created thousands of videos of just beautiful top shelf playing. So <clears throat> Mateus, if you see this, love you, wish you nothing but the best and uh, we're, we're, all, uh, we're all here when you're ready to come back. So uh, best wishes to you. Um, but that sparked a bit of a, a conversation piece across the guitar community. Um, guys like Jack Gardner mentioned it, fellow guitar players in, in, in the internet community. And then it started spider webbing out to uh, huge celebrities um, in the guitar community. Guys like Joe Bonamassa were talking about it. Uh, Guitar.com was talking about it, guitar player. But everybody started talking about the, the mental health aspect of social media. And it was interesting that just one person, Mateus, uh, announcing his departure, uh, sparked a huge conversation. And that got my gears grinding. Um, last week, my grandfather passed away. And that creates another layer of mental health when we get it, when we start approaching social media and, and what we're even thinking about in the headspace we're in. So instead of inviting a guitar player onto the show, I decided to invite a uh, someone who specializes in this field of mental health. And this is uh, LCSW and an assistant at the University of Tennessee, assistant professor at the University of Tennessee, Miss Stephanie Weatherstone. Uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for being here and talking to us a, a bit on uh, these these topics, you know, and, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, I sent you uh, a couple of links, just some articles and stuff. Um, first of all, what is, what is your opinion of the current climate of, of social media without it applying to any certain demographic? 
like just the broad aspect like what is instagram what is facebook what are these things doing um to the to the average person in in your field that you see on the day-to-day yeah um well first thank you for having me for sure um and i i'm always happy to talk about therapy because i'm a therapy nerd so um you know what i see very much in my practice is that social media is an effort to connect and an effort to have a voice and so whether you're using your voice for you know a political rant or whether you're using your voice to share a heartfelt story um people want to be heard but they also want to connect and that's really the, the the more base issue is we need to connect with each other and the unfortunate thing about social media is that it's sort of a false connection it's a pseudo connection so we reach out and we connect we're on these you know we're on these screens and we're scrolling and you know scrolling and scrolling and looking at images but we're not actually talking we're not feeling we're not we're not getting literal hugs to be a little cliche um and that's that's a huge loss really and you know it's an absent process it's something we're not really thinking about when we're doing it um and that's also you know hurtful i think to us individually that's great. That's a great launching pad because I have immediately 50,000 questions I just want to fire <laughs> off. Um, let's start with the first, which is the pseudo connection, right? One of the things that uh, became a, a, a big conversational piece regarding this in, in my field was the idea of being trapped within the confines of the platform itself, whether that be you know Instagram or Facebook or whatever. Uh, you're, you're trapped within 15 20 seconds or X amount of lines. If it's Twitter, you only have X amount of lines to say what you got to say. Um, and, and the false connection, right? It's interesting because social media at its core, the very, very smallest seed, I think can be a very good thing because it allows organic connection because it opens that way to be like, you know, I'd love to send you an email. I, I mean, I'm I, you know, this is why right. we're doing this and this is how we're right. doing it. So it, it, it is this gateway, but we kind of don't, we as humans, in my opinion, we don't do the platform justice for all the good it can do. We, we kind of get right. caught up in the, the value of ourselves with clicks and likes. So when you talk about um, the false, uh, false connection, um, how do you see that affecting someone? Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of demographics. Um, how does the 15 year old girl who has never known anything except Snapchat and social media, who's maybe in, in high school and that's a challenging enough road to go through as it is. And then how does that affect someone who is maybe in their late twenties, early thirties, who is professional, who is designed where their work revolves around social media, right? How can this, how can we learn from these things to improve ourselves and how can we dodge some of the negative aspects? Could you just all of that as a topic roll on that for a minute? Right. Um, well, you, you mentioned gateway and I like that, that terminology sort of as a metaphor that social media is a wonderful gateway and, and a launching pad in its own right. Right. The, our problem is follow through. Right. So we just kind of stay in this bridge space, which to me is, is how I sort of envision social media. It's a bridge and we're just hanging out on the bridge. We're never actually getting right to the other side, right? What so, would you call the other side? Um, real connection. Intimacy. Like, like a phone call or a, you know, even a Zoom chat, just some kind of actual yeah. connection over, instead of just texting on a public forum, right? Exactly. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. You know, and it's that it's, and that's a form of intimacy, right? That's the other thing that's false here is a pseudo intimacy, right? We're like sharing all our feelings and our likes and our little hearts you know, and I, I mean, that, that's not, it's very, it's passive. And it's, even if it is at someone's core sincere, giving every human the benefit of the doubt being human, um, it still doesn't land that way, right? That's just not how it lands. So if you, you know, put that in the context of 15 year old girl, right? Or even 15 year old boy. Sure. I didn't mean to, to gender identify yeah. <laughs> but, but you know what i'm saying i just like that 15 year old who's in totally. totally well and i do think that there's there's some merit though to the idea that it might impact girls a little more a little differently than boys that's a thing that's maybe another topic but the the 15 year old developmentally they literally we literally don't have all of our brain at that age 
right? This part up here in the front that does all of our reasoning and adulting um, doesn't even start to grow like it's an organ until we're around 13. Yeah. And doesn't finish until we're in our mid to late 20s. So like that whole piece of the brain is, is now getting wired, hardwired for just passive interactions, right? And it's all about the image, all about the image, all about the image, not about the person. Mm -hmm. right? So that also makes a, a person who's not going to get, not going to become whole, at least not in a traditional sense for a much longer time. It's going to delay that for sure. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. I was going to say now when, when you're talking about the, uh, the youth, well, I, that for lack of a better word, I'm just going to go with you, the youth for the, versus the uh, late twenties. Um, the interesting thing that you grazed over was just the passiveness of it. Yeah. Right. So when you look at how that passiveness, like I'll say this at many times in my life, in my thirties, social media I, I just doom scroll for lack of a better word and it's like i'm not even looking for anything you know what i mean right. so what what is that drastically different between someone who is an adult with a fully formed i don't think my brain will ever fully form but if, if it would yeah. would that be um in that and i think i think it's interesting because you and i are cusp people right we had yeah. no internet and then we had internet and we're right. in it right so what is that what is that like for someone who is not fully developed and how different is that between a non-fully developed and a, and a fully developed brain that doom scroll aspect yeah i think so in a fully developed brain we have um we have reference points we have context and we can as we're doom scrolling like that we can even if it's quick and passive we can sort it you know, think like sorting in boxes, right? We can go, this goes here and this goes here and this goes here. We have places- A bit more on a subconscious level. Is that fair to yeah. say? Yeah, yeah. I think it's fair, definitely. But kids don't have that. They don't have, a, they have one box. <laughs> All of the things, one box, right? And if they're, you know, 15, 16, a little bit older adolescent, they might have two boxes, good and bad. But even then, they, they don't know what that means. You ask a 16-year-old or 15-year-old, well, what does it mean? You know, that's bad. What, what do you mean bad? Help me understand your very, because my version of bad and yours is different. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't have anywhere to put it. So that means they're carrying a different type of baggage into adulthood that we haven't even really begun to kind of unpack what that's going to be like for them. Right. Yeah. And when you talk about, you know, you mentioned too, like doom scrolling, you know, that, that you might do it passively, like you're not really looking for anything. You just, you actually are looking for something. You're looking for something to grab your attention. And whether it's to grab your heart or to grab your mind, you're looking for it to, you're looking to be grabbed by something, you know, and it's just, there's so much out there. You can still do it for hours and hours and, and not really find what you don't know that you're looking for. Oh, that's a good topic right there. So um, that ties in directly to what I do for a living, right? And um, I want to talk about what it what it means to have a like, what that does to a person, and and the dislike and the negative comment. And I'll, I'll I'll be open right here. I'll, I'll I'll pretend I'm laying on the couch and we're doing the thing, right? Uh -huh. um, when I am when I am making content, I'm pretty new to YouTube. Um, I've played professionally touring for artists and spent more time on the road than I've done anything. And, you know, so over the course of the pandemic, I got more into this, this type of environment and content creation. And luckily the community really was into what I was doing. Right. Mm -hmm. But it takes one negative comment when I was first getting into it to just really just like, what the crap I, I'm giving you something for free. You don't even have to comment. Like, right. so what, what will you talk about? how the value of likes and dislikes, and we'll talk about the professional aspect of it in a second, but on the emotional aspect, the value of like and dislike, what can that do to a person? Um, what can that do when it comes to the Kardashianification of, 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 of society where we're putting this value on ourselves based on how many likes? And I'm speaking on the macro right now not just musicians yeah. I'm, I'm still talking about the teenage girl to the adult musician and and yeah. you know my dad who's 70 years old who's he's on Facebook <laughs> right. for whatever reason you know so like the right. value of likes and dislikes and what that does to our psyche um mm -hmm. on the day-to-day -day and how that can evolve into something 
big and dark. Yeah, well, it's basically this constant measuring stick, right? It's, you know, if you get, like, I've had some of the kids I work with, some of the teens I work with, I had one girl um, tell me, she's like, well, you know, I got 10 likes on this thing. I'm like, oh, well, how'd you feel about that? She's like, she looks at me, she's like, Stephanie, 10 likes is like terrible. They might as well be dislikes. I mean, 10 is nothing. It means I'm nothing. It's a huge statement, right? To say, it means I'm nothing, right? It's where we're loading our self-worth into a stupid looking little icon that goes like this, right? And I know that the, the intent of that, I'm sure if we were to try and talk to Mr. Zuckerberg, right, he would explain to us that the intent of that is to cheer people on, yeah. right? And, you know, I'm sure we, it's- we as a people have perverted that. Yes. Yes. Because our inner critic is really strong. Everybody's got one, you know, in terms of like how, how much power that inner critic has um, is determines how valuable those likes or lack of likes is. Right. Gosh, that is, that is so, that hits me to the core, right? The inner critic. I think mm-hmm. every musician out there is it has a different level of inner ki- critic, and maybe I should say the term artist. But yeah. when we're expressing create creatively. Um, our inner critic is hard enough just to be able to be like, ah, oh, I feel good about doing this before there's even another person to hear it. That's right. That's and right. so, so compounding that with the idea of like I'm going to post this publicly. Now compounding that with the idea of the version that you're posting publicly is not the average version. Um, for instance, I think it's fair to say that every musician that I know on a professional level takes multiple takes at putting mm-hmm. something together. I lean towards the side of I would rather do 50 takes and right. post the one great one versus mm-hmm. do one video take and mime it to an edited version. Everybody's got a different way of cr- making right. creativity. Um, and I think Mateus, and, and not just Mateus, but I think Sean Tubbs or any of these guys would would take a lot of takes to post something that they actually played. Right. Okay. One thing that plagues our community is the idea of a guy miming something that's completely edited or filtered or gone in and chopped and pieced together. And what he's actually presenting is, hey, I can do this. He can't even do. Right. 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 So all of this, when you're talking about that inner critic thing, that mm-hmm. is a nightmare mentally before you even get to the idea of a like or a dislike. That's and right. I think that's really perverted my industry um, mm-hmm. and twisted it into a dark thing where why would a guy need to feel like that's the case that he even needs to make a mind take. And that this that was a major topic last year. There's been several yeah. artists that like, they didn't have their pl- guitar plugged in or whatever. It's like whatever yeah. dumb thing it was, you know what I mean? Right, whatever right. Dumb stuff. And to it's me, protective though, isn't it, it? I mean, it's protective. And, and, and yeah. yeah, will you just talk about that idea of like what all that can do? Yeah. I mean, as, as an artist, I mean, that the very nature definition of what you do is built on emotion. So that means by definition, everything you present, you're not, you're not presenting some, um, something that somebody else made and said, Hey, I'm not a sales guy. You know, you're not selling something. You're, you're pouring out your own heart. Right, you're kind of opening up that space that the majority of the population keeps closed off, you know, and letting it out there. So as soon as someone, the notion that people can be critical of art, first of all, is is a little perverse in its own right, because you know the artists are just like you said, they're all artists are quite critical of their work, right? But because they love it, right, and they they want to present a certain essence. Right. And when you're looking for an essence, well, it's probably going to take a few more takes to really give a vision or a feeling or something you want to convey. Right. You want to get it the right way because you don't you're not going to get to interpret it for the person. Right. You go into an art museum and you see art on the wall. The artist usually is not standing there to tell you what to think about it. Mm -hmm. So similarly with music. Right. Whether it's on the on the radio or played live, you're not telling us how to receive it. You're hoping that we get some kind of emotional registering of it from you. And that's about the best you can hope for, even if it's not exactly your vision 
it's a vision of an emotion. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. I, like, this is the kind of stuff I would not get if I interviewed another guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> right. So here's the interesting thing too about art and uh, mm -hmm. what we're talking about is is even wh whether you make sculptures or play the mandolin, like right, whatever it is, we're not dealing with a quantifiable thing. It's not like right. mathematics where it's like it is a factor. It's not. I think right. some people could argue uh, to a point where you could say an eighth note is an eighth note or 16th note is this note. But even then I could say, well, what if you swing it? And people would be right. like, what's the swing? I'm like, exactly. Because right. swing to Charlie Parker is completely different than swing to Tony Rice. And that's where the mathematics go out the window. And that's where a university like University of Tennessee, where I went to school, they have to put the word theory on the back of music because you're not teaching right. music. You're teaching a theoretical, philosophical. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Okay. So, so we've been talking about the um, the poster, the one posting the, the content, the, the, the young girl, right. the artist, whatever. Talk to me a bit about the mentality of the person consuming it, because here's a couple of things I want to hear about. Yeah. How accustomed we have become in instantly digestible content. Oh. We want we want it now. We want to throw it out the window. Look at WandaVision, the, the show on mm -hmm. Marvel. A lot of people wrote it off in the first three or four episodes because it didn't make a lot of sense. And now that it's starting to come together, people are like, oh, this is brilliant. And it's like, well, you didn't like it when you didn't have the whole picture, right? And talk right. to me about the person who does not make it. This is something that's really important to me. And maybe I put too much emphasis on it. But talk to me about the person who doesn't create anything but is, mm -hmm. is the one typing and and because a lot of times when i get a negative comment and ben eller mm -hmm. and i've talked about it it's like i get a negative comment i immediately go to their page because right. i want to see how i want to see how valid this person is if i yes. saw that it was if, if i if i posted a solo and i'm going to use people that i know so i don't feel like i'm just hating people right yeah. um if i posted a jazz you know a, a cover of donna lee and steve kovalchek in colorado who teaches up there uh, on a on a university level if he posted back and said hey man you know you're not really swinging that right or you're not you don't have the right feel i would immediately go to his page and be like oh this is steve caval checking university right. of Colorado, whatever right. this is a completely valid i need to put weight in it i right. can't tell you one time stephanie that i've had a negative comment where that person created anything right so talk to me about the consumer right that's a lot more complicated because you know that's going to be you're talking about people who are potentially actually very lonely. That's possible. Um, you're talking about people who are constantly fearful, maybe have an imposter syndrome of their own um, that kind of keeps them right from that space of creating, like I can't create for fear of failure. Um, and then there's the folks that just need to discharge their own irritation at life. right? And they're just gonna put it out there and be like, I can be everybody's critic. You know, and being critical of another is a way to feed your own self-esteem. Like if I if I go and I, you know, and I say something nasty about something I see on one of one of your videos, right? And completely out of my realm, right? I'm not a guitarist and wouldn't know what I'm speaking of, except to say whether I liked it or didn't like it. And I come up with other reasons. I'm really just trying to make myself feel better because I have to be one upped on somebody. And so if I'm discharging that, right, it's just like throwing it at you and it's not on me anymore and I'm okay. Yeah. I'm giving away my upset to you. And now you're gonna hold it and you're like, what is this? <laughs> Why do I have this awful thing in my hands, right? And it's, it's because, well, I had to give it away because I can't hold on to it, too. it's too much. I gotta give it to you. That really got way out of control last year being a heavily heated political year and all of a sudden i saw all of this hatred and all of this expertise for lack of a better word yeah from people that do not have political science degrees from right. people that have no expertise in the field claiming one side or the other like i i, I keep my channel completely non but but you can acknowledge as, as a as a as a bystander um one mm -hmm. of the great tweets that i saw um whether you agreed with him or not Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine had uh -huh. somebody say, oh, great, another musician throwing their hat in the ring of politics. And he simply tweeted back something to the effect of, uh, you don't have to be a uh, 
top graduating class at the University of Harvard in political science to see the injustice that's happening. That was his response. And then it said dot, dot, dot. But as someone who graduated at the top of their class in political science at University of Harvard, I'll go ahead and guarantee that for you. And I was just like, wow, this guy is actually, whether you agree with his opinion or not, he has a studied, he's done the work. So the foundation, yeah, done the work. And he is, I, I immediately value his opinion a little bit more, not because of maybe I agree or disagree right. with him politically, but it's like, this guy has expertise. Right. That is why you're here. I put a lot of right. value on people that have done the work. Right? right. So what is it about our psyche that makes us not do the work, mm-hmm. but throw the opinion? Does that just go back to, I feel bad. Now you feel bad and I feel better. Is it really that simple? Yeah. And a fear of failure, a little of both, depending on the person, right? You know, it's either I expect that I, I can't achieve because my inner critic is overbearing. Like I can't, I, I can't even see past my inner critic. Um, so I have to give that to someone else. You know, I had a, a patient tell me one time, she was real hateful to me one day in group, you know, and that, that happens sometimes, like in group therapy, because people are hurting, right? Hurt, hurt, people who are hurting hurt others, right? And so, but she, you know, lashed out at me in group and, you know, I just kind of let it roll off my back because it's, it's part of the work. It's what you do. But she came up to me afterwards and she came to apologize. And she's like, you know, I'm sorry. You didn't really deserve all that. And I was like, wow, okay, this is great insight. I'm like getting excited as a therapist. What's coming next? And all she offered was she's like, sometimes, you know what? You can only hate on yourself so much and you just have to hate somebody else for a while. <sighs> wow. I, yeah. I hope everyone who is watching this in the, in the guitar community puts a big asterisk beside that. That's yeah. really important. Um, I know I can be very self damaging because I'm a mm-hmm. perfectionist and it's hard. You know, it's, I, I, I guarantee I'm not the only guitar player that feels that way. Uh, yeah. We have taken this conversation into some dark places. Mm-hmm. I would like to just maybe try to do some Jedi things and take it to a light place here. Yeah. How can we improve both as the creator And by that, let's go macro. Let's say from the teenage and high school to the me to to so on. How can we improve on the creator side? What we choose to post? How do we how do we deal with our self critics? How do we deal with those things as the creator? And then part two of that, how do we fix it on the consumer side? Yeah, and and again, one is easier than the other, right? You can you can work on yourself all day long. Working on other people, well, that's up to the other people. Well, no, I mean, how do we fix it as if we're the consumer? Like, and oh, we're, see. you see what I'm saying? Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I want to know how I fix it as Andy, the guy who posts YouTube videos. And right. there's a day coming very soon where we're going to be touring again, and my yeah. content will have to shift. I'm going to continue right. doing this stuff, but it's not going to be from home, right? right. How, do I imp- how do I just take care of my mental health as the creator? Mm-hmm. And then how do I take care of my mental health as the consumer and the doom scrolling, because I don't want to make this episode about Mateus, but one of the things that Mateus right. talked about was being trapped in the mm-hmm. confines of 15 to 60 second content. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's a little bit more on the work side of the, he, he had made like this body of work of albums, right? He's right. spent his whole career making all these YouTube video or YouTube or Instagram posts or whatever. Yeah. Um, all of that on the creator side, how do we improve Improves not the right word. How do we prevent some of that stuff? How do we take action to take care of ourselves outside of what Mateus has done? I applaud what he's done. He has yeah, stepped totally. out of the platform. He's like, I can't do this. It's making me crazy. I'm paraphrasing a course, but like, right. he's like, I applaud it and I can't hug him big enough. Right. Yeah. How do we do things on a smaller level than just deleting the app? Obviously I can just say delete the app. But the, I want to know, I want to know your perspective on the small side. What can you do? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and definitely deleting the app is an option, even if it's temporary, right? Like a hiatus, right? Because we all know we can regenerate those uh, accounts very easily, right? They're by design. We can stop them and start them as we wish. Um, there's that. But I think that, you know, the real key is to make sure that you're conscious of what you're doing, right? If you're... Creating content, who are you creating it for? Who's your real audience? Is it for you that you want to share? Is it, you know, for some people that you know enjoy it, a particular audience? And learning how to discharge your own 
upset your own critic and say, you know what, my critic doesn't have to like take in the extra criticism. It just doesn't have to. Because there's also, you know, what we also talk about sometimes in therapy is the higher and wiser self, right? So your higher and wiser self is that very best iteration of yourself you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And it's also the one that gives you grace, always, no matter what, loves you unconditionally. That's our Yoda, right? Yes, absolutely. I'm a huge Yoda fan also, totally my idol. So your, uh, your inner Yoda, right, is absolutely benevolent. Right. And loves everything you do. And, you know, even if it, if it hits your perfect little sweet spot or not. And so really embracing that. And one of the ways that you can start to tap into that, though, is taking a little time away. I think we don't realize quite how much time we spend on the screen. And especially with the pandemic, um, you know, we're all sitting in this seated in a collective trauma. That's what this is. And also it's isolating us by force. And it's keeping us actually more attached to our screens because it's our very best way to not lose our people, right? So that's important, but you still have to have space. You need more literal FaceTime with people um, if you can get it safely, obviously. But even like talking on the phone, hearing an auditory voice as opposed to like doing this kind of thing will, will feed you. You have to find ways to feed yourself, to feed your soul, right? Because that's what makes you strong enough to hear, see those dislikes and see those haters and those comments and go, eh, you know, they're doing them. Oh, well, I'm doing me and that's what matters. Right. Does that make sense? I love that. Um, I really love the line about just hearing an auditor, an actual voice, because I feel right. like so many things and so many flamed up arguments flare up because someone actually didn't really intend the verbiage, the grammatical choices to be as intense as the other person read. Them. Right. And like right. immediately, even in our conversation today, I'm very self-aware of going, Oh, I didn't mean to gender pocket that. Right. I couldn't just go. I could just see it being like, well, cancel Andy Wood. He's <laughs> not, not gender neutral or whatever. I'm just completely making fun of, you know, making light of the situation. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, and now now let's throw that into the situation just for two seconds because I don't want to dwell on it. Um, in the form of cancel culture, how much power is in this? And I, I don't want to talk any opinion one way or the other on, but I will say for those who don't know, it's it's everywhere. You know what I mean? And and I, I think there's a difference we need to see. And I'd like to know your opinion. What's mm -hmm. the difference between cancel culture and consequence culture? Mm. Um, one has accountability and the other does not. Okay, elaborate, please. Yeah, so cancel culture is I'm done with you, I don't have to see it. Bye bye. It's all it's all just gone. It like it it's the idea anyway. It's not really what happens, but the idea is that it evaporates. I'm like, and I'm done. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Blah, blah, blah. You know, go around about my day. Consequences, I mean, that's holding people accountable for stuff. The problem with consequences is we forget that consequences are supposed to be, it's an outcome. That's what a consequence is. A consequence, and it can actually be positive or it can be negative. Even if the initial action could be perceived as negative, because let's look at uh, things. I I'm just going to be very broad, but mm -hmm. like Jimmy Kimmel dealt with it for being on the man show dressed as Carl Malone. Uh, Gina oh, I got a last name, but she is Cara Dune on Mandalorian. She tweeted some stuff. Now it has consequences. Uh, Morgan Wallen just dealt with it uh, a couple of years ago. James Gunn dealt with it for tweets that were nine years old. You know, right. if somebody went back and, and we had these devices and I was 17, I'm not perfect. And God knows what I said. And I, I don't even know what I said, but I know it's not good. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm right. so it's like, right. I know I did some stuff that's bad, you know? Um, but right, right. it's interesting when it's a a wave of people. And, a, and when I say a wave, we're talking mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands, millions of people all at once dogpiling in defense of or in offense of, right? When so the consequence culture that I think is not maybe taking accountability on that, that guy typing that guy, he's, he's not yeah. thinking that like this yeah, guy yeah. did something bad. His career is not getting lost because we're canceling him. His career is getting, it, it's a consequence mm -hmm. of what he's doing. So will you maybe elaborate right. on the mentality that goes around lack of a better word, mob mentality? 
Like, talk about some of that stuff when mm-hmm. you see it online. Yeah. If well, you can talk about it with it, like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, that's a huge topic. Right. Right. Just yeah. Our number one, you know, our number one drive is being human is to bond. Number one, it's above sex. It's above shelter. It's above food. It's to bond. Well, not right? to me. So Musicians that- have this other priority on sex. That's really high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a different, maybe it's a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah i mean that's but that's the thing is we we're, we have this like our uh what we sometimes call our reptilian brain right the one where libido lives and the pleasure centers live and feelings live and the first part of our brain that we get to have that one is really strong it's tiny but it's strong and it tells us we have to bond whatever that means right so part of mob mentality is is still about belonging you know, we, I think we're continuing to miss the value of belonging and what that means. And it's not fitting in. Fitting in is not the same thing, right? Belonging is, I know you're my tribe and I know come as I am, right? I'm going to be accepted no matter what, right? That's belonging. You know, fitting in is, I got to make sure my hair is right. I got to have the right, you know, accessories on, right? Am I all done up? And what's my background look like, right? That's, that's all about fitting in. Belonging is, you know, we're just here hanging out, having a conversation. Right? And that, that's what people are seeking. And to name that though, for people to like say, I just want to belong, right? Feels like a little kid, right? It makes us feel like suddenly I'm very small because that also means we're vulnerable and it's an emotional place to want to belong because then you risk rejection and all of that is just so scary, right? So that's, you know, that the mob mentality really comes from that, I think, you know, and the, the need to cancel and the need to have consequences and punish people. We've become very dichotomous, you know, have everything black and white, you know, and part of that is, is just we're not, we're afraid of having opinions because we're afraid of losing and afraid of being abandoned. I think there's a huge culture of fear that we've actually probably been living in longer than the last four years. I think most people would say it just started four years ago. That's not true. I think that what's true is that the last four years are a symptom or like the visible now symptom of what's actually been under the surface for a very long time. Right. Yeah. So like, let, let me ask you on your opinion. Maybe this isn't a professional, but it's a little more personal. When do you think YouTube went, it, could you just throw a year at me, when it went to a more personal level? Because I remember when it started and it was like cats and people falling mm-hmm. downstairs and dogs farting and this, and it was like, it was totally yeah. non-personal. Like, right. and you're, you're using the term of four years, obviously due to, you know, situations like the pandemic and just the, you know, right. whatever, but like everything. everything, right? So like when it goes back beyond that, what, at what point did Facebook, I had no value on Facebook when it started. Yeah. I had no value yeah. on MySpace when it started. I had zero value on how many people follow me or not. I didn't right. do YouTube till last year right. because I was home. When did when did it start to shift? Maybe you could even use your, your uh, uh, um, what's the word? Patience, right? Maybe use, when did they start putting so much value on that? I only got ten likes thing. Right, right. Is that four years or is it longer? I, you know, that's a great question, and I'm not sure that I I have a good point of reference for that. I, but putting in the context of of my patients, who definitely my my youngsters. Um, educate me on the regular. I learn all kinds of new words all the time. Um, but about the likes and the importance of likes and doing YouTube and TikToks, like TikToks are really big now among my clients. Um, I would say that probably is in the last maybe maybe five years. So it is what we're all considering recent. So it's it's almost like in a lot of ways we're creating these perfect storms with all of this ability to communicate. Totally. totally. Which we've never had. Look how much we could do, how much good we could do in the world with the power that's in our hand. You know what I mean? I remember when a TI-85 was mind-blowing. You know what I mean? (laughs) And the thing is, it's like, that's not that long ago. 
Like that's a total dad sentence, right? But I'm not 75 years old, you know. Yeah. So that's not that long ago. It's it's almost right. like it's almost like we're living a bit of a mirror image in the communication era, the way the industrial revolution right. was, and the horse and cart, and all of a sudden you got a car and we're flying in 30 years. Right. Like we were right. drawing buggies with horses, and now there's people in the air. Right. right. It's kind of like that now. Right. But with a more I don't like the word dangerous, a more volatile media. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Because yeah. this stuff can hurt on an emotional level and right. cause people to feel truly trapped and to exit huge careers or take breaks from huge careers or right. not post and like, or fake a post or God. No, I mean, it's like, yeah. good Lord, like the, the amount of technology and how to make your waist look small on a, these right. filters is like, I didn't even know you could do that. You know, it's like, right. I'm, I'm very educated with my female friends too. They can't, they're like, right. Oh no, she's not that tiny. I'm just like, what right. the hell are we talking right. about? Well, and so, yeah. So one of my uh, specialty areas is disordered eating. I'm actually a certified eating disorder specialist too. So as soon as you mention that, I'm like, Oh yeah. Uh, Instagram is like a living nightmare for my client. Did you run with that for just a minute or two? Yeah. So in terms of why it's a nightmare, the, the cause, the reaction, how to, and, and most importantly, I think one of the things I want to keep at the forefront of our exiting the conversation is how yeah. to fix it. Please right, right. end your thoughts with like, and this is some thoughts on how to fix it. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, the, so the, it's a kind of a runaway train, right? Instagram is, and especially if you have a client, so if we're speaking about like the, the eating disorder client, who's very, who has a body image problem, um, but also has more importantly, a self-esteem problem. That's really what the problem is. Um, the body is just an easy target. And so, you know, Instagram and things like that are a runaway train for how can I like, I can, I can analyze, like, I can look at this picture and ooh, filters, right? So ooh, I can make myself look thinner. I can make myself look more shapely if that's what I want. Um, I can do literally anything to basically make myself into a Barbie doll <laughs> if I wanted to. Um, and so that's dangerous because then that becomes the image you want to have. That becomes the image you adopt as the, as the right image for yourself. And you get a lot of likes on it. So then that just reinforces it. And then suddenly you're like, well, oh shit, I don't look like that. So now what? And that's when some of the behavior comes in. That right there. And the way you just talked about that with that unfiltered honesty. Yeah. That's exactly what happens to the guitar community when they're miming. Right. They wake up and they're like, I can't play like that live. Right. Like I'm, I made all this content and I, now I don't sound like that. Now, obviously right. I have to clarify because I don't want anyone in the comments here saying, well, Mateus is like, of course I've sat right next to him and play. He's not the guy I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, there, there, right. there's a whole subculture. Ironically, yeah. it's not the guys at the top of the game. You know, it's not the John Mayer's, right. the Bonamassas. It's the right. guys trying to claw their way up. You know what I mean? Right. And they're the ones that t tend to post what I consider fake content, just like right. the body dysmorphia thing. Right. Absolutely. Right. And it's setting your, and you don't even realize when you're doing it, that you're kind of setting yourself up for a disaster. <laughs> right. <laughs> what happens if somebody calls you to play like a big artist calls you to play yeah. and you can't do it. Right. <laughs> right. 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 It's a, that's a consequence that people don't think about. And I think that's that kind of risk of, of all the scrolling and all the trying to fit in and all that is that we create this entity, right? Almost like our own avatar, right? Of, of ourselves that we're putting out in the world. And then at some point, at some point, you're going to be accountable for it. You know, at some point, you're going to walk out your door into the outside world and somebody's going to, you know, hold you accountable for either what you're supposed to look like and you don't what you're supposed to sound like and you don't, you know, and, and that's so much worse and more painful, right. Than if you were to just be as you are, yeah. I think in terms of like, what do we do about it? Yeah. How, how do you, how do you fix it or, or not fix it, but what can I take on a daily, but when my feet hit the ground and I start my life on the day to day, what, what steps can I take to uh, prevent some of that stuff? Yeah. I think it's embracing your own authentic self, which is a, probably a bigger ask than, um, it sounds really simple to say, well, just be your authentic self. <laughs> but there really is truth in that, you know, and for people who have influence, 
I think that's, that's part of what's key. If you know that you have any kind of influence, finding ways to not only be authentic yourself, but promote authenticity, that is going to be our way out ultimately, if we can figure that out. I and love that. That trendy either, right? Let's not say, oh, yeah, I'm going to be, you know, Uber myself. I'm not going to shower for four days. Yeah. Well, that's not where we want to go. <laughs> I, I like to throw props right now to uh, Jason Isbell, uh, one of my favorite singer songwriters. He posts all his posts are like uh -huh. him sitting in his living room, just playing. There's like no, there's nothing to it. It doesn't have production. He's not like using door. It's like, there's no, it's just him. Um, right. maybe, maybe that's something if, if there's anybody that's playing out there and they're just trying to figure out how to improve their day to day. I love that. Just be yourself. Mm -hmm. And I know that's like, that's the thing that's uh, uh, the genie says to Aladdin. Like, yeah. You gotta fix your problems. And he turns and Robin Williams turns into a bee. He's be yeah. yourself, right? It's so easy to say that. It's so easy to acknowledge that with a with a licensed professional. Right. The hardest thing to do is be self accountable and actually do that. Right. So is there any advice on the <laughs> day to day to break the bad habits, to break the almost obsessive compulsiveness? to edit the photo, to do the thing. Like how, where does, how do you deal with that? And then how do you deal with it if you are a working professional in that space? Like how do you mentally do it? Right. I think one of the, one of the best, like you have to interrupt it somehow. You have to interrupt this flow of constancy. Like we're just constantly, constantly, constantly in motion. We're scrolling, we're walking, we're scrolling, we're walking, we're checking our email. You have to interrupt that. And one of the, the one of my favorite uh, tools to give clients is uh, to talk about urge surfing. You know, in, in the context of what I do, it has a little bit different connotation. We're trying to surf the urge to engage in harmful behaviors. Um, it's just a little bit different context, but you can use it for every day. It's really all it's about is pressing pause. It's that okay? My let's say my my desire right now is to grab my phone and go to my Facebook or my Instagram, right? And I want to grab it right now. I'm going to go there. I'm going to start scrolling. If you can, that's the urge. The urge is to do that, to recognize I want to do this right now. And then to be able to go, okay, I can press pause for five minutes. I mean, you got to start small because the idea of saying, I'm not going to use my phone or my Instagram for a whole day. That's a big ask, right? So five minutes, do something else. And if, if at the end of five minutes or 10 minutes, 10 minutes is probably a better window, truthfully. Um, if, at the, if at the end of that amount of time, you still want to go back and you really want to check for something and look at something, then do it. Like, don't punish yourself for it. But start to find ways to give yourself breathing space. Press pause on that desire to, to jump in and do something. Because then also when you go back, like let's say 10 minutes later, so you do that. Say, okay, I'm going to 10 minutes and I'm going to go away and I'm going to come back. And then you come back in that 10 minutes and you're like, what was I looking for? Odds are you're not going to remember. If you do remember, you're going to go back in with some intention. Have intention, right? So pressing pause and then finding an intention. What is it I'm wanting to find out? Am I going to Instagram because I'm bored? Am I going because I just posted something and I just am dying to know how many likes I got? You know, what is your intention? And know that. Go That's so powerful. Yeah. Like going, going in with intent. Uh, mm -hmm. is, that's so powerful to prevent doom scrolling, you know? Right. That yeah. I love that. I, I mean, I think that's something that ironically I talk about when I do clinics, when mm -hmm. we sit down to practice about nine times out of 10, when we sit down to practice our instruments, we, yeah. we pick it up and we just play something we know we could play. And it's a habitual lick that we know. Uh -huh. it's, I, I call them pet licks. Yeah. It's the lick that you have, the pet lick. But to yeah. sit down with it with intent and be like, I am going to play in this time signature. I'm going to play in this key. I'm going to use these changes to practice with intent. You know, um, yes. that that application to social media is super, super great. So thank you for that, for sure. Yeah. Is there any other types of uh, steps that we can do um, to just maybe let's scope out just a little bit and just help our mental health on a day to day. Maybe our, our, would you have any advice for the pandemic that we're still navigating ourselves through and being trapped with, you know, with, with the same person for 
<laughs> the time. Or, or on a negative side, having no one. And maybe that is a catalyst to doom scrolling, right? right. Do you have right. any closing thoughts? Because I don't want to take up too much of your time. And this has been amazing. I could talk to you about this stuff for hours. Um, and for me but too. It's super great. And you've been super helpful. But I'd love to just leave with some some shades of light and hope here on how, 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 how can we just navigate better mental health? Yeah. So, you know, it, it's very much a back to basics kind of answer actually that, you know, some people might be like, this is kind of cheesy, but it's the truth and getting some kind of fresh air or sunlight every day you know, around here. Like, okay, the last two weeks, that's like really hard, right? It's really cold. <laughs> You can do it, but it's going to be cold. (laughs) Really, really cold. Um, And also really, really wet, which is kind of gross. But, you know, even five minutes, you know, I think we we're so accustomed in our culture. Everything's got to be now, now, now. And we're like, well, five minutes outside is no time. Well, you know what? You spend 25 minutes on this thing without even thinking about it. So, you know, to step outside for five minutes Seriously, you know, the, the fresh air, it connects with nature, the sunlight. I can't express enough the value of sunlight. There's research study after research study about that. So for depression. Um, All my studio musicians, you taking notes? Right. <laughs> I'm the world's worst. I sit in dark studios all the time. <laughs> like, all my session players out there, take notes. Go outside. Go outside. Get out of the building. Um, you know, Talking to people, keeping that up is so important. We really are in a collective trauma and we really need to own that this pandemic is a trauma. It is, and we're all experiencing it differently and at different levels and, and whatnot. It's a continuum, but it's a long-term trauma. And we're already seeing the health fallout like in my practice and everywhere else. And to take care of ourselves during this, nurturing, going outside, talking to people, getting sunlight, continuing to talk. I think we forget, especially when we're cooped up with the same people or alone, you know, all day long. My husband and I joke that it's a good thing we like each other so much because, you know, we we do. We have a very happy marriage and, and, you know, but we like each other, right? You can't imagine, and I see so much in my practice, couples who don't like each other, yeah. like it, and they might love each other. I still might question that, um, but they don't like each other anymore, you know? That's terrible. So finding somebody that you can connect with, you know, if you, um, if you've never, this is a great time in the world to get a plant, to get a pet, you know, having greenery in your dark studios, get a shade loving plant, you know, all those kinds of things, bringing us closer to nature. You can touch the leaves. You can, you know, you have to touch the dirt to see if you need to water it. Um, All of those kinds of connections stimulate sensors and certain input in our brain that draws up dopamine and and brings us relief. Um, We just have to remember to engage. I love it. I love it. One last question, Um, especially in my field, Uh, addiction, right? The addiction to the phone, Yep. the addiction to the social media, just as dangerous as substance addiction. You know, it's like Uh all that mess. How do we battle addiction? This will be maybe the last topic. Just how how can we take a baby step to go outside? I love the wait 10 minutes. Is it still there? Yeah. Like, is there anything that you could advise in, in a couple of sentences about addiction? Because in a pandemic, substance right. abuse, oh, totally. Instagram abuse. Right. Well, you know, those are, even substance abuse, all addiction is a process addiction. I actually teach a class in this. So maybe I should even schedule another uh chat because I could I could literally talk all day and talk your ear off about what constitutes an addiction but also what to do about it um addictions are complicated so you know a true addiction is a perfect storm of all kinds of things that come together it's resiliency versus you know dose or exposure to negative experience or fractured relationships all those kinds of things and they snowball and it's this one big thing and then poof you have an addiction because the addiction is all about self-soothing. It's all about, I need to soothe myself. I need to nurture myself. Um, I need, I'm not heard when I want to be heard. I'm not appreciated, like in a loving way, not in a Kardashian way, 
right? I see uh, all of this just reflect around the, the yeah. Instagram community and, and gosh, it's just crazy that, I mean, it's very obvious you do this for a living. <laughs> <laughs> So what can we do to fix it? Like is it baby step. You, you don't have to give me a solution because again, you know, that's a, a, yeah. you know, a course is worth a degrees worth of information, but yeah. what's a baby step? How can we fix the addiction and maybe a, a step that will apply to the bottle or the phone? Yeah. The it's all about connection. It really actually is full circle, right? We're talking about connection and nurturing each other, nurturing ourselves, you know, I have clients all the time that say, well, if I do something for myself, that's selfish. No, it's not. Mm. not. You know, taking a day for yourself, taking a mental health day, people, you know, frown upon that. Many businesses frown upon that. Um, but they shouldn't because we need that. If you need space, take space. If you need to soak in a bath at night before you go to bed, do it. Take the time to do it. Um, if you need more creative time in the kitchen, go do that. You know, nurture yourself. Don't shortcut yourself because, oh, I don't have time. Or someone says going to be mad. Or I got to hurry up because I'm, I'm chronically late. Well, you know what? If you're chronically late, that's probably because you don't like what you're doing. And so maybe you need to rethink what it is you're doing. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. a nuclear bomb right there. Right. <laughs> I mean, that right there, that can hit a, hit a lot of things. I'm very, I'm, I'm very fortunate to love what I do. Yeah. Same here. I, I, and, and my problem is, I'll work too much, you yeah. know, like I sit down here for hours working on 15 different projects. I just love being involved with music, you know? Um, right. I, and I, I cannot thank you enough for being, being here and sharing your knowledge and helping us take a look maybe into a, a different perspective. I think, I hope this is uh, something that the viewers will like. Most of the time they want to learn licks and <laughs> want to hear pedals and check out amps and stuff. But, uh, you know, this right here, when that thing spiraled, I just, I felt like I was being spoken to. Yeah. When guitar.com was, you know, guitar player and everybody's talking about yeah. this stuff. And, and, I mean, it's the gutsiest move on the planet just to turn it off. Like, you know, yeah. and I, I applaud that. So uh, I thank you for your time and your knowledge. And uh, man, this is really great. This is really yeah. great. Well, you're welcome. And thank you so much for having me. Because I think that, you know, reaching different audiences is really, you know, what we need to help people be healthy mentally. You know, we've got, pe got to have people stop thinking that, you know, their mental health is not valuable because it is valuable, right? It's kind of everything, right? <laughs> Our perception of the world is in there. I'm the world's worst. I have to admit my faults. Like I'll, in, in Talladega Nights, uh, mm -hmm. with, with Will Ferrell, he's like, I'm yeah. gonna my emotions, I'm gonna put them in a little bitty box. I'm gonna bear it right <laughs> outside. I'm never gonna talk about it again. Cause that's what <laughs> we do. Like, right. I'm, I'm like, that is me. That's what yeah. I do. I'm just like, but I think, you know, I, I do yeah. have an advantage. I think a lot of artists have an advantage because they mm -hmm. can get it out in another exactly. form of that. So, I that, yeah, yeah I, I'm blessed, but if you don't have that, or maybe, you know, if you do have that and you're just not pouring it the right way, you know, it's like, gosh, right. yeah. The, the mental health aspect of uh, mm -hmm. not valuing it. I, I'm <laughs> definitely guilty of that. Yeah. You know, I have a family that full of strong men who didn't talk about their feelings. You know, <laughs> just yeah. Like, yeah. So, yeah. No, I'm a, I'm a big believer that, that the arts could heal us out of this pandemic. I really believe that, you know, I was, I was actually a dancer for like 37 years. So I have my own performing arts background and um, I, the expression of emotion that comes out there, there aren't words. We don't have vocabulary. We don't have written vocabulary for what comes out through art. Right. So, you know, I do think that could be a healing place. And so, the more people that can, the more particularly of your audience, right, that can attend to their own mental health and stay safe and stay healthy and well and nourished, um, the better for all of us. Yeah, that's great. I, I, I appreciate you so much for being on yeah. here. I can't wait to get this, uh, get this uploaded. This is going to be amazing. Cool. I'm excited too. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Stay on the line. I'm just going to yeah. stop recording now. Thank you. Okay.